بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وافضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا ومولانا محمد الصادق الوعد الأمين وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابة الغر المحجلين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد صلاة تشفينا بها من جميع الأمراض وتقضي لنا بها جميع الأغراض وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد صلاة تشفينا وسلم عليه سلاما يداوينا وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبصار والبصائر وضيائها وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين وفقنا توفيق الصالحين ونفعنا اللهم بالقرآن والذكر الحكيم O oh Allah, grant us the openings of the Gnostics and the guidance of the pious and benefit us through the Qur'an, the wise reminder. Allahumma allimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima allamtana wa zidna ilman yuqarribuna minka bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin. O oh Allah, teach us knowledge which will benefit us and benefit us through what you have already taught us and increase us in knowledge which will bring us closer to you, O the most merciful of those who show mercy. Allahumma la sahla illa ma ja'altahu sahla wa anta ya hayyu ya qayyum taj'alu al-hazna idha shi'ta sahlan sahla O Allah, nothing is easy except that which you make easy and if you wish, O the ever-living, the self-subsisting you can make the difficult things easy. وَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ الْعَلِيِّ الْعَظِيمِ وَصَلِّ وَسَلِّمْ وَبَارِكْ عَلَى سَيْدَنَا مُحَمَّدٍ وَعَلَىٰ آلِهِ وَأَصْحَابِهِ جَمْعَيْنِ وَبَعَدْ السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Alhamdulillah, today we've gathered for a noble purpose. We've gathered to relate and talk about one of the great Awliya, one of the great men of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Imam Hatim al-Asam, rahmatullah alayhi. And as we're going to talk about his life, we need to remember that we're just not here just to relate history. We're not here just to relate history or talk about the events that occurred for a particular person. The purpose of reading about the awliya, about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala related the stories of the previous prophets to our prophet, our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi sallam. And Allah says, why? لِنُثَبِّتُ بِهِ fu'adak. In order that we may strengthen your heart. Fu'ad, in what's in deep inside. In order that we may, may make firm what's inside. So when we relate these stories and we learn about great men and women of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's a source of strengthening our iman. It's a source of making us firm upon our deen to relate and learn about what the others before us went through. May Allah be pleased with them. So Imam Hatim al-Asam was born in Khurasan, modern day Persia. And he was a student of somebody very important as well. I don't know if we've done, or the series has done, the friend of Allah, the saint, the master, uh, Shaqiq al-Balkhi. Have we talked about them? This is, some, this is a name that we need to talk about. Sayyidina Shaqiq al-Balkhi, rahmatullah alayhi. Uh, Imam Hatim al asam was actually the student of Imam Shaqiq al-Balkhi, rahmatullah alayhi. There's many stories about the great Imam, which we'll relate um, some other time, inshallah ta'ala. Maybe we've already chosen our next friend of Allah topic, Allah alam. Um, and there's an particular incident between the student and shaykh which summarizes the true meaning of awliya, the true meaning of spirituality and the true meaning of sahba, companionship of the awliya, of the ulama, which I'm going to relate towards the end, inshaAllah ta'ala. 
Um, he's known as Hatim al Asam. Those of you who know Arabic will know that Asam means deaf. Can't hear. Hatim al Asam, rahmatullah alayhi, could hear perfectly. He wasn't deaf. Um, but the reason why he was given this title, it's a beautiful story. It's actually, you know, one of the, it's an amazing story uh, why he was given the title Hatim al Asam, Hatim, the deaf one. And he wasn't deaf at all. Uh, some say he had some hearing deficiencies, not really established in the reports. What happened was, he was the imam, he was a noble person, a leader of the community, a scholar, as well as a pious man. People would look up to him and go to him for advice and you know share their trust in someone, so they share their problems and ask for advice and uh, questions and answers and so forth. Uh, once a lady came to him, and this lady was telling him about her situation. I'm not sure exactly what it was. Um, I think it may be about divorce and husband and problems and those kind of things, right? Um, and as she was talking and, and asking him for advice and telling him her situation, um, all of a sudden, and this happens sometimes, um, she released wind and it made a noise as well, it made a sound. So imagine how you would feel if you were speaking to someone and that happened, right? This, she felt horrible, she felt embarrassed, you know, maybe blushed, and she didn't know where to put her face, in other words. And, you know, the Imam was there, the great Imam, and he you know what he did. He said, what did you say? I didn't quite catch what you were talking about. Could you repeat yourself a bit louder so that I can hear what you're saying? Because my hearing's not too good. So he pretended to be deaf, pretended that he had a deficiency in his hearing. So she said, did you not hear any of what I've been saying to you and what's been happening? Because I haven't heard anything. You're not speaking loud enough. I can't hear much. And she saw a big smile came on her face. She realized he hasn't heard what happened. And she felt, you know, the embarrassment left her and the feeling and she felt happy. She felt happy, she felt joyous. Like, look, alhamdulillah, nothing bad happened to me. I wasn't embarrassed in front of this great Imam, this great Sheikh of the city. Um, and she said, it's okay, don't worry about it. And she went on her way. She went away happy. And this is a beautiful thing because the Prophet ﷺ said, from amongst the most beloved deeds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to enter surur, happiness, into the heart of a believer. It's one of the most beloved deeds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just with one uh, piece of wittiness and you know, thoughtfulness, look how the Imam made this woman so happy. And she didn't feel embarrassed about herself. And from that day on, he, he became known as Hatim al-Asam. So actually he said he went, carried on pretending to be deaf just for that lady. Subhanallah. This is who he was, Rahmatullah. This was how he was known as um, Hatim al Asam. He was in uh, Khurasan and he traveled around the Islamic world and he accompanied his teacher, Imam Shaqiq al Balkhi, and he learned from him. And he himself had students. He was a scholar by right, by learning. Um, and he's more famously known for his sayings. But one of the things he was a part of was fighting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what we know as jihad and this is something very important that I want to highlight that people may not know they might think otherwise but it's very important we understand this correctly the spiritual people the Sufis as we know them were the first and foremost to fight for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you look throughout history even recent history like you know Uthman ibn Fodio in the African Continent, Salah uh, al Ayyubi, Rahmatullah Ali, you know, Al Amir, um, you know, Al Amir Muhammad Al Fatih, in, you know, Al Qastantiniya in Istanbul. You know, his Shia Sheikh, his Sheikh was um, Sheikh Aq Shamsuddin, who would give him spiritual guidance, as you know, he had a, a Murshid, a Sufi Sheikh. These were the leaders of spreading Islam. These were the leaders of defending the Islamic lands. And Imam Shamil, the Sanusiya in North Africa, um, and so forth. And even in Syria, Mufti Wajid, may Allah preserve him, was mentioning um, the great awliya and the great ulama. They were the leaders of the resistance against the French occupation. People like the Muhaddith al-Akbar, the great Muhaddith, Sheikh Badr al-Din al-Hassani, rahmatullah and his students. Sheikh Sharif al-Yaqubi and his students and disciples would he would themselves go out into the uh, mountains of Lebanon to fight against the French who had come to occupy their lands and colonize them or occupy and and, and so forth and they led the resist resistance against and it was organized jihad and this is what I want to make a point on this was true 
resistance and fighting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the freedom of their land, to protect their land. And Sayyidina Hatim al Asam was one of those who would go to the borders of the Islamic lands and defend the borders because that's where the attack in those days was most likely to come from. So they were involved in true form of defending and fighting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we see out there now is unfortunately maybe not true jihad. Um, these people need to study jihad. You know, if I said to one of you, pray, and you hadn't studied how to pray, you hadn't learned wudu, you hadn't learned ghusl, you hadn't learned your fara'id, would you be able to pray? Would you be able to do me a prayer? Or would you feel embarrassed saying, you know, you know, I don't know how to pray? If I ask somebody here to pay their zakat, you've got money in the bank account at home, would you be able to pay your zakat? If I just said, go and pay your zakat, is it as easy as just, you know, being told? What would you have to do? You have to learn how to pray. You have to learn how to uh, give your zakat. There's rules and regulations. There's conditions. You may not be eligible for zakat. You may not be liable for zakat. Who knows? You have to study in order to implement. This deen is built on knowledge. Sound knowledge. If we say to somebody, and we don't say this, but if somebody was to say, go on jihad, right? We don't say this, obviously. What would that person do? Just go on jihad and go wherever, you know. It doesn't work like that. You need to ask the question, what is jihad? And then we need to open the books, just like we'd open the books for salah, just like we open the books for fiqh, you know, um, zakat and fasting and hajj and transactions, you know, a business, partnerships, renting and hiring and leasing. These are all chapters in fiqh. You know what? There's a chapter in fiqh called Kitab al-Seer or Kitab al-Jihad. There's a chapter on this. And how jihad is performed when it's an obligation, when it's not an obligation, when it's a fard kifaya, a communal obligation. What are the situations? What are you allowed to do and not allowed to do? How do you treat prisoners of war? How do you give da'wah? The book of da'wah, the fiqh of da'wah is contained within the book of jihad. Do we know these things? If we don't know, then how can we act upon these things? The people who supposedly and unfortunately, they don't go on real jihad. They are claiming to go on jihad or they are maybe enticed and, you know, um, beguiled to go on jihad and they're in a sort of sensitive and, you know, weak position. They may well be innocent inwardly. They might be, you know, used by other people. But they're not going on true jihad because they haven't studied jihad and they know what they're doing. Even if you were to pray without knowledge, it wouldn't be the same prayer. Even if you supposedly did jihad without knowledge, it wouldn't be the same jihad. And this is the problem. The true ulama, the true awliya, Establish this aspect of the deen. They're not when people get this idea that Sufis or spiritual people do, do, just go into their you know houses or their caves or their whatever um, centers and they don't come out and they just do Allah Allah and they lose to dhikr and that's it. No, they were fully a part of society. The Sufis were scholars. They were doctors. They were mujahids. They were any job. You know, they were anything and everything. Spirituality is an aspect of our Islam. That's added to whatever you do in your life. It's not something separate from you being a, you know, a father or being a colleague of someone or an employee. It's part and parcel of the whole package of Islam. And this is what Imam Hatim al Asam was. He was known as being a mujahid. And there's a famous miracle and incident of him when he was um, fighting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was in a battle and he was amongst the front um, rose and he was um, attacked by somebody in a horse from the opposite side and the person managed to knock him off his horse and get him onto the ground and he you know made him fair you know um, held him onto the ground and he t picked a dagger out of his pocket to stab and kill Imam Hatim al Asam. so Imam Hatim says at this point my heart did not become distraught my heart did not feel any uh, harm or fear rather I saw it as the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he was about to bring about upon me and I surrendered my heart was tranquil in other words this is my ending this is what it's meant to be alhamdulillah I can't do anything this is Allah's decree why should I be upset so at that point an arrow struck this man who was about to stab me and he fell back dead I got himself off me, I got him off myself, got up and went back to 
the battle and continue to fight for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this was one of the miracles of Imam Hatim al-Asam, that his heart was with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, when they did jihad, when they did their prayer, when they did their actions, their hearts were with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what we need to achieve. When we are at work, when we are with family, when we are at the masjid, when we're walking on the street, we need to remember that Allah is our Lord. Allah is watching us. Allah is aware of what we do. And we should behave accordingly. Our hearts should be in this state. The constant state of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's two types of remembrance. Remembrance that comes with the sound or remembrance on the tongue. And remembrance that's inward in the heart. You remember and reminisce in the heart. And you also remember and talk and reminisce with the tongue. We need both in our lives. The tongue affects the heart and the heart affects the tongue. So the more dhikr we do on our tongues, the stronger our remembrance of Allah in the hearts will become. And the more we remember in Allah in our hearts and try to remember Him and recall His bounties, the more shukr and the more dhikr and the more remembrance of Him we will indeed make. So this comes together. This Imam Hatim al-Assam was the Imam of this. He actually was asked, how do you make your prayer so good? Actually, the word was actually, that, that wasn't the question. It say, the question was, إِنَّكَ تُصَلِّي You pray, meaning you pray perfectly. You pray. How do you pray like that? That was the question given to him. You pray, but how do you pray like you pray? So he gave the answer. There's a few reports about his answer, but um, one of the questions actually is, how do you attain khushu in your salah? We see you have this khushu, this um, humility and stillness and serenity before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you pray. How do you achieve this? So Imam Hatim al-Assam replied, I imagine the Kaaba is in front of me and I am above the Sirat which is over Jahannam and to my right is paradise and to my left is the hellfire and the messenger of Allah وسلم, is watching me and that death is behind me waiting for me to finish and to take me. And I begin with the intention of glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of magnifying his lofty status. And I stand between hope and fear, hope that my prayer will be accepted and fear that it won't. And I say Allahu Akbar and recite the Quran with tartil, harmoniously, with a measured recitation. And I bow in humility and prostrate submissively. I give my heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's one of the few places prostration where your heart is below your head think about this all the all the bodily movements you do and this you know the, the postures you are in when you're in sajda your heart is quite a lot below your, your 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 head your intellect your thinking is below your heart you're surrendering to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala i prostrate submissively and i pray as though it is my last prayer this is how i pray when he was asked, how do you pray? This was the hal, the, the, the inward state of this noble imam and he would stand to pray every single time. Where are we now? When we prayed just now Salat al-Maghrib, where was our minds? You know, was it when we're going to get home for football or, you know, roti is going to be ready at this time, I better eat roti first before the talk, you know. We, we plan around roti and we plan around, you know, TV programs and we plan around, you know, whatever the latest updates are, I don't know. And we don't plan around the prayer. You know, we don't con put our concentration into the prayer. The hadith states about the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam say that Aisha, the beloved wife of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, anha says that when the adhan would be called and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would hear the adhan, he would not be aware of what's going on around him. He would make his way to the masjid. He would stop everything, leave everything, and he would concentrate wholeheartedly on the prayer. And we wouldn't, you know be noticeable to him. He wouldn't be aware of what was going on. His concern was the salah. His concern was the prayer. So this is how concerned the Prophet ﷺ was. He would say to Sayyidina Bilal, his Prophet would get restless, that we're not praying, we're not praying. So he would say to Bilal, get up, do the adhan, you know, um, give us comfort in the prayer. You know, we're not able to pray until you do the adhan and the iqam and then we can pray. So get up and do the adhan. So they couldn't wait for the time for the prayer to enter. So they could find... <laughs> Arihna uh, biha ya Bilal. You know, give us comfort with this, O Bilal. 
This is what the Prophet ﷺ would say and to Sayyidina Bilal, the Mu'addin or the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. Um, one of the things that Imam Hatim al-Asam is known for is his pieces of wisdom. So I'm going to share a few of those. He's got a beautiful saying and we should reflect over this saying actually. Uh, he says, no morning arrives without Satan, uh, Satan, Shaitan, asking me, what will you eat? What will you wear? And where will you find shelter? He was giving advice to people. In other words, we all wake up with the same concerns. Where am, where's my sustenance today? What am I going to wear today? Who's going to give me shelter today? And not for the, the, you know, the next day, but every day, right? The next week, the year. We all plan for our future. Just maintenance. It's a common thought for everyone. He says, this is the waswasa shaitan whispers this to you every morning. Every morning that this happens. Meaning, in other words, we all think about this every day. And he says, I reply, every day I reply, I will eat death, wear my shroud, and find shelter in my grave. I say this every morning. This is what I say. I will eat death, wear my shroud, and find shelter in my grave. And this is a very important concept. He has another saying actually uh, about death. He says, um, whoever enters this path of ours uh, shall bring about in himself four kinds of death. Four kinds of death. A white death. al al abiyad, Which is hunger. A black death. Which is to bear the harms and the um, you know, uh, oppression of other people. The red death, which is to oppose one, one's desires, one's nafs. And the green death, which is to wear patched clothes, to wear ragged old clothes. And this is something very important, the concept of death. I'm not talking about physical death here, right? Physically die, physiologically, is something else. We're talking about metaphorical death. And it's very important because it's mentioned in the books uh, of the spiritual path that you have to die for deaths. Sheikh Al-Akbar, Imam Muhyiddin Al-Akbar, we did a, a Friends of Allah about them recently, um, talks about this in some of his books as well, the four types of death. It's mentioned by many of the awliya and the salihin in their books. Uh, and just to talk about death, we're afraid of death, right? Death brings pain, agony, separation. Nobody wants to die, right? If we think about it, we don't want to die. We're scared. We don't know what's coming after death. We don't know what's going to happen to us after death. So there's the element of fear, element of not knowing. So people don't want to go through that. They want to avoid it and not talk about it. And if you talk about death, some people say to you, can't you talk about something better? Can't you know, maybe live in the atmosphere. They don't want to talk about death anymore. But the Prophet ﷺ said, mention often the destroyer of desires, Hadimul Laddat, death. Mention it often. You know, one hadith, I believe is a weak hadith, but it says the one who mentions or remembers death has a, regularly has a rank of the martyrs. This is the, the remembrance of death in Islam. Because why? It rectifies you. What's the death that the Imam is talking about? Is that you have to kill your nafs. Not literally kill it. Metaphorically overcome your nafs. How do you overcome this? And what do you do? There's certain elements. There's the physical pain we have to go through. You know, when you don't eat, right, this desire, this pain, and you, don't, you have to go through physical pain, fasting. There's a um, bearing the harms of others. There's a, there's a level of um, mental, if you like, that you have to just surrender yourself. Not think how great I am, but, you know, say, if they are treating me like this, then maybe this is my position with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe I am a dog and let them treat me like a dog. But to bear the harms of other people. You have to kill yourself. It's all about the nafs. You're already back to killing the self. Um, to oppose the nafs itself, it takes a lot of effort. Struggle. People don't want to make this struggle, right? People don't want to make the effort to oppose their desires. They rather eat what they want and sleep as much as they can and enjoy the TV programs and entertainment, right? Wasting of hour upon hour and you know, days upon days. They add up to days upon days and weeks upon weeks. You know, you're going to come at the end of your life and you will have slept approximately a third. Right? If you have a life of 60 years, 20 years, you're sleeping. 40 years left. 
Now, if you watch two, three, four hours of TV a day, there goes another ten years, seven, eight years. Seven, eight years of your life you sat in front of a box or a screen. Now, what's what, this is your capital. Your life, your time is your capital. You can't waste it. You have to oppose enough to... You, you, we do it for dunya, right? We know that this deal, this job, we spend extra hours at work. We do you know, a lot more efforts to get the deal done or to get a client or whatever you know, type of job you're in. We'll struggle and sacrifice and go through that pain barrier and the tiredness and the fatigue to get a bit more money in the bank account, right? to get more customers, to get more likes on Facebook. Right? Whatever it is, people make the efforts. But when it comes to the nafs, so struggle to improve yourself, all of a sudden people are like, I can't do it. It's too difficult. You know, I'm all right where I am. Yeah, TK, no problem. People have a very, very um, low aspiration. You know, where, where's, the, where's this himma gone? You know, spiritual aspiration to become, and it's the best thing. You know, the best thing you can ever do is to become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's nothing greater you know getting close to the messenger of Allah is the means to getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nothing greater than doing these things yeah we, we, we neglect all these things we don't make the effort to do these things and we make the efforts to do all the dunyawi things the worldly the lowly things that tells you our state and one of the scholars one of the sayings of the scholars I think is Imam Ibn uh, Abu Faraj ibn al Jawzi, rahmatullah alayhi, um, he's saying is, لا يرضى بالدون إلا الأدنى, something like this, that nobody uh, is happy with what's less, what's lower, except the one who himself is low. He himself has got no status, no self value. So if you're thinking to yourself right now, I'm happy with where I am, I don't care if I don't read extra salah or do a lot of zikr or I've got good akhlaq with others or, you know, etc, etc. At least I'm doing my minimum, fard, right? I'm doing my fard, I'll make it to paradise. Then you've actually lowered yourself. That's what, you've, that's what the imam is saying. Nobody's content with the, the, the lower of life, except those who are low in life. We wouldn't accept that for our car, our house, our clothes. You know, we want the best. Yet for the deen, we don't make that effort to be the best. Where are our priorities? You know, it's not wrong to have the dunya at all. But if it becomes a priority over your deen, it does become wrong. This is the important thing. Because many of the Sahaba were very wealthy and had, you know, but they didn't put that, that didn't come in between them and their iman, them and their Lord, their responsibilities. So alhamdulillah, make dua that if you are being given dunya, that Allah give you the tawfiq to give, be strong in deen and to use the dunya for the deen. This is how we should uh, take this. Um, and this is the biggest thing. You know, we want something, right? We want to, we want to achieve something. Imam ibn Atta'illah rahmatullah has got a beautiful uh, saying. He says, uh, Ya ilahi, ma'adha faqada man wajadak wa ma'adha wajada man faqada." Oh my Lord, oh Allah, oh my God, what has he found, the one who has lost you? And what has he lost, the one who has found you? Not literally uh, losing and finding, right? But being with Allah. Who has lost anything? Who has been diminished in any way? The one who is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And who has ever increased, ever been blessed if he is not with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the goal, that these deaths that we're talking about are the spiritual struggle to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know, everybody, kullu nafsin, da'iqatul maut. Every nafs will taste death. But this death is only for the special, for the elite. For those who want to be at that rank of awliya Allah, of ibad Allah, slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the servants, the saints, the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Each and every one of us has that potential. Don't think you can't be one of these people. We need to revigorate our aspirations and have this determination to be strong in deen. We'll do it for dunya. We need to make the intention to do it for our deen. And no, not one of us here should think that we cannot do this. I'm not good enough. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who put you in the situation you are in now, can make you amongst the awliya, can make you amongst the salihin. There's a discussion amongst the uh, um, 
scholars, does a wali know if he's a wali? Right? It's a discussion. Uh, Imam Yusuf and Abahan discuss it in some of his works. Um, we won't go into the discussion, but you don't necessarily need to know. You don't need to know if you're a wali. Um, some wali awliya do know that they're given access to the diwan where the name of the awliya is kept, etc. And some don't know that they're amongst the awliya. Um, it's not necessary to know that you're a wali. So maybe with your steadfastness, your determination, your ibadah and so forth, you will reach a level of wilaya of being a saint or close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the care of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You might not re- realize that. But you should strive to achieve um, this level of proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that means ridding yourself of the lowly states. Something that Imam Hatim al asan did for 40 years. I believe he accompanied his shaykh for 40 years. Imam Shaqiq al balkhi 40 years he accompanied his shaykh. In the, the shaykh is an essential component to have a spiritual guide, somebody who can show you the way. Because the way is not ABC. It's, got, it's, it's a struggle first and foremost, but it's also got dangers on the path. That if you don't have guidance, you can lose the way. You know, every day you wake up, what should I do this thicker? Do I read the Quran? You know, uh, should I fast today? Or what should I do with my time now? Should I spend it with family? You don't understand how to do things. Why? Because you haven't taken guidance. You haven't read about the life of the Messenger of Allah You haven't sat with um, the awliya and the salihin and the shuyukh who can give you this guidance and, and, and set you on the path to success in this life and the next. So the company, accompanying a shaykh is essential. And in those days, there was no official um, bay'ah, allegiance process. It was sohbah. So Imam Hatim al asam accompanied his shaykh for 40 years. In other words, this is my shaykh. Why, why? I'm going to be with him all the time. I love him. Sayyidina Anas, the companion, radiyallahu ta'ala, who had a, had a student, one of the tabi'een, called uh, Thabit al-Bunani, accompanied his f- teacher for 40 years as well. Thabit al-Bunani accompanied Sayyidina Anas, a companion of the Prophet sallallahu for 40 years. This is how long they would remain the companionship of their shaykh. So a company is the key to success. Um, they say, um, مَا أَفْلَحَ مَنْ أَفْلَحْ إِلَّا بِصُحْبَةِ مَنْ أَفْلَحْ Nobody has been successful or has achieved success except by accompanying those who have achieved success. So it's a very important key to success that you accompany those. You know, in the Quran, suhba is an important topic. يَا أَيُّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَكُونُوا مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ Oh you who believe, have taqwa of Allah, be aware of Allah. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be with the truthful ones. In other words, fear Allah, but how do you change? Allah didn't say, wasduqu and be truthful. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us? And be with the truthful. If you want to become a siddiq, you want to be sadiq al aqwal, true in your speech, then accompany those who are true in their speech. You want to be true to your word and promises, accompany those who are true to their word and promises. You want to become generous, <coughs> accompany the generous. And they will show you what being noble and generous is. And you learn this from their companionship. This is how you do it. And if you want to become anything, if you want to become a mufti, accompany the, the, the muftun, you know. If you want to become a mechanic, accompany the mechanics. This is how it's done. It's a law of life. It's one of the sunan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whoever you're with, you will take from what they have. This is one of the sayings. The, the, your disposition, who you are, it affects others. It takes from, it steals from, what is, uh, from the other disposition. So if you're with somebody and they act a particular way or they do certain things, you'll slowly find yourself doing those things. So find the company of good people. Imam Hatim al Asam accompanied his Shaykh, Shaykh Shaqiq al Balkhi, for 40 years. Now, if you knew who Shaykh, uh, Imam Shaqiq al Balkhi was, you'd understand what that means. That's why I gave the example of Sayyidina Thabit al-Bunani and Sayyidina Anas. Right? 40 years of the companionship of Sayyidina Anas, the servant of the Messenger of Allah Wasallam. Imagine who Sayyidina Thabit became. They say about Sayyidina Thabit, they, the day they buried him, um, um, they had to redig his grave, I believe, for something, Allah Alam. And they found him standing in his grave praying. They st- found him standing in his grave praying after they buried him. Rahmatullahi. This was Sayyidina Thabit al-Bunani. You know, he accompanied Sayyidina Anas for 40 years, right? Sayyidina Anas said that, he mentioned the famous hadith that once my, the Prophet Sallam sent me on an errand and on the way I met my mother and my mother said to me, what are you doing? And he said, I'm going to do something for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she said, don't divulge the secret of the Messenger of Allah 
وسلم, to anybody. You know, don't tell me what you do. That is, just be, keep quiet. You told me what you're doing, khalas. And he said, oh mother, I would never do that. I wouldn't have told you anyway, in other words. I would never tell you that. Because it's the secret of, it's the, you know, the, the message that Allah told me. And he was, he was narrating this hadith to his students. And he said he didn't intend to say nathabit. He would make sit on the bedding himself on a seat. So people would come in, he'd make Sayyidina Thabit sit with him to show them, this is my top student. And he turned to Sayyidina Thabit and he said, Oh Thabit, were I to tell anybody what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu told me to do, it would have been you. It would have been, this was the attachment of teacher to student. So Sayyidina Shaqiq al-Balkhi was a teacher and said Imam Hatim al-Assam was a student. 40 years, imagine the attachment they had. There's a saying, um, the final, one of the things that happened at the end of their companionship, Imam Shariq al Balkhi said to Hatim al Asam, Imam Hatim, you accompanied, for 40, you accompanied me for 40 years. <coughs> what have you learnt? What have you learnt in these 40 years? Tell me. What are you going to take away? And Imam Ghazali quotes this particular uh, incident. So I'm going to read it to you from his recording. It's recorded, in, I believe, in Ihya al Madin, parts of it in Ihya al Madin, in many works. Um, but it's fully narrated in a book called Ayyu al Walad, O oh, my dear child, O oh, my dear son, uh, disciple. So it says, um, meditate on some other quotations. Hatim al Asam was one of the companions of Shaqiq al Balkhi. May Allah have mercy upon them both. And one day he asked him and said, You have kept my company with me for 30 years. Pardon me, it's 30 years. What have you got out of them? He replied, I got eight useful lessons by way of knowledge and they are enough for me. For I hope to my deliverance and salvation will be in them. So Shaqiq said, what are they? What are these eight lessons? And the eight beautiful lessons. The first, I'm going to summarize them, it will take a really long time. I observed mankind and everybody had an object of love and infatuation. I looked at all these objects that people were attached to, that they loved. Some of what people loved remained with them to their sickness. And some went to their graves and the graveside. But they all returned back. Except for one thing. The things you love like your wealth, your family, your belongings. They're all with you until the grave. Right? When you go to a grave, they all go back. Nobody remains behind. Except for one thing. And he said that was good actions. That was al-a'mal al-salihat. Pious deeds, righteous actions. So I pondered and I said the best of what one, lo one loves is what will enter one's grave. So I took them, took good actions as the object of my love to be a light for me in my grave and to be a friend to me in it and not leave me alone. The second lesson that I learned was I saw Mankind being guided by their pleasures. This is something common today which we need to understand. We allow our hawa, our passion, our whims to control us. Whatever you want to do inside, that's what you do. You don't have discipline. Uh, and hurrying to what their egos desired. So I meditated upon the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. As for him who feared the station of his Lord and kept the soul back, prevented, prohibited the soul from its hawa, its, its caprice, its whim, its passion, what it desires. Then surely Jannah, paradise, is his final abode, the place of refuge and where he will take. And he said, I was certain, and we should all be certain, that the Quran is genuine truth. So I hurried to what my ego did not like, and I set at work to combat it and restrain it from its pleasures. Because that's what it says in the Quran. As for the one who opposes, who prevents, prohibits his nafs from its desires. Until I was satisfied with obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then, then I stopped opposing my nafs. And this is something you can achieve, the awliya do achieve. Is there comes a time where they don't have to oppose their nafs. The nafs itself becomes, it wants to do dhikr. It wants, and they're careful of that as well, that they don't want the the hadd nafs their own nafs to be happy with the dhikr they want to be solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the hadith supports this لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يكون هواه تبعا لما جئت به the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said as recorded by Imam Nawawi in his Arba'een one of the hadith of the 40 hadith 
that none of you will believe, truly believe, have perfect Iman until his hawa, this very word, his desire, his passion, his caprice, what he wants, is in accordance with what I have brought. So when you want that, that's perfect Iman. So he, what Ibn Hatim was saying was, I achieved that rank. I carried on struggling against myself. It wasn't one day, it wasn't a week, it was many, many years. But this is what I learned and this is what I did. The third useful lesson, I saw every individual in mankind exerting himself in accumulating the ephemeral, the temporary things of the world, then clutching at them, laying hold to them. And I medit meditated on his saying, reflect over the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ma'indakum yanfad wa ma'indallahi baq. What is with you dwindles, dies away, perishes. And what is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is eternal. Baq, is, it is eternal. It is remaining now. Not it will remain. It is eternal. So I sacrificed the gains I got from the world to Allah the Exalted. And I distributed them among the poor. So he gave plenty of charity for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that they might become a treasure for me with Allah the Exalted. The fourth useful lesson that I saw, that, that I learned, is that I saw that some of the mankind believed their status, their nobility and their standing to be in the size of their nations, their tribes. Um, so they were conceited because of this. But I reflected over the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ Truly, surely, the noblest of you in the Allah, with Allah, in the sight of Allah, are the most God conscious, the ones with the most taqwa, atqakum. So I chose taqwa, believing the Quran to be accurate truth, as my standard for status. In other words, feeling Allah, being aware of Allah is true status, true nobility, true uh, loftiness in, 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 and rank in society, in, in this dunya and the akhirah. Not the uh, size of your house or the job, or how many people you know respect you or your political status even right and you know your leader this isn't nobility and status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what is nobility and status with Allah to have taqwa and then she says um, and I took their opinion and evaluation utterly empty and falsehood what people think is status and good I regarded it as falsehood the fifth useful lesson is that I saw some people blaming others and some slandering others and I found that was through envy regarding money. Envy regarding money. People said things and said bad things. So I meditated on his saying, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, نَحْنُ قَسَمْنَا بَيْنَهُمْ مَعِيشَتَهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا We are the ones who have distributed their sustenance amongst them in the life of this world. It's Allah who has given this person what possessions he has, and this person what he has and she has. Don't envy others. Don't think that is wrong or why did Allah do that? You're opposing the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He decided that. Don't argue with it. Accept it, move on. Don't, don't have envy of it. This is the lesson. Look at what is required of you by Sharia and act accordingly. Because sometimes the decree is difficult to accept. It's, a, it's an illness. Have patience. Sometimes you are given wealth, but use it in the right way. Don't envy others for the situation or the status they are in. Um, and I understood that the distribution was from Allah in eternity, in pre-eternity. So I did not envy anyone and was content with what Allah had given me. So look at Imam Hatim al-Asam, the lessons he learned from his teacher over these, these 30 years. He was a man of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He'd, he'd refined his soul. You know, he'd, he'd, he'd achieved this lofty status of being you know, uh, Waliullah, Abdullah, a you know, true slave of Allah, the true meaning of the word. He was a true mu'min. So he had no envy in his heart, no hatred in his heart. He had contentment. You know, al-qana'atu kanzun la yafna. You know, contentment is a treasure which never is never ending, never finishes. You know, we should have contentment in our hearts for what Allah has given us. Uh, and they say something we should practice as well that when it comes to the deen, look at those above you. Masha Allah, learned. Masha Allah, practicing, reading the Quran regularly, um, in a good way, right? Look at those. So I'm, I'm, I'm. I know this brother prays the Hajjat. I know he does this. Use that to improve yourself. I'm falling short. MashaAllah, the brother does work. We work to what? Build, get, buy a car. He works to go on Umrah. You know? You just work. Soon he's got the money for Umrah. He does Umrah. He comes back to visit the Messenger of Allah. Look at his love, look at his love for the Prophet. How much he sacrifices. He works and gives charity. 
Subhanallah. You use people in the deen above you or do, who outwardly are doing better than you and try to emulate them or use them as a standard to improve yourself. But when it comes to the dunya, look at those less fortunate than you. Look at those who are more in, in more um, difficult situations. Right? You know, people complain about their houses. You know, the people that house in the world. My bed isn't soft enough. There's people who haven't got a, a roof over their head or a bed to sleep on. They sleep on the floor, on the on the on the you know sand or on the tarmac. They don't have a choice of this meal or that meal. You complain about you know I didn't get this the too much marcha in the salon, right? You know World War Three, right? What's going on? You know people haven't got food and you're complaining about too much salt or too much this or too much that. You know waliyadu billah. And we see refuge in Allah. So look at in the in the dunya. Look at those who are less fortunate. It will make you thankful. It will you want, you will never have a complaint if you really did this. Have contentment with what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given you. The sixth lesson: I saw some people acting with hostility towards others, uh, to some motive and cause. So you know people are, have enemies. They have hostilities, and this is a problem we have with people, even brothers in the same family, start fighting each other. Right? Even friends all of a sudden become enemies. Hostilities, enmity, you know, in, in the heart. So it comes about. So he says, I saw people fighting each other and having uh, taking other people as enemies, in other words. So he says, so he said, I meditated on the ayah in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In shaytana lakum aduun fattahiduhu aduwa. Surely, verily, Satan is an enemy to you. So take him as an enemy. In other words, assume that role. He's my enemy. He's the one I should be fighting against. And the Imam says, and I understood that enmity towards anyone but shaitan was not allowed. Shaitan is the enemy. Anything that is shaitanic, in other words, evil. The seventh lesson that I learned, I saw everyone striving in earnest and working intensely in quest of their food and livelihood to the point that they thereby fell into what was dubious and banned and haram, degrading themselves and lowering their worth. So I meditated on the Quranic ayah وَمَا مِن دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقُهَا There is not a creature on the earth except without uh, on earth without its provision being upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I understood that my provision, my sustenance dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not on my job not on my education, not on my business. It depends on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah could close my business down tomorrow. The crops might not grow because Allah might not want them to grow. I might have a bank balance, it could disappear. Because Allah is in power, in control of everything. So make your heart depend on Allah for your sustenance. Not on the bank balance, not on the cupboards full of food, not on your job. That's a means to the result. This is a very important concept. Which unfortunately, not knowing basic aqidah, has a role on effect to having problems in life. Right? The spiritual path is built on sound aqidah. Without sound aqidah, fard ain, you can't progress. It's you know essential. There's something called asbab and musababat. These words might sound funny, but simply put, a cause is an effect. You have a means to something, and then you have the result. Fire burns. So the means to achieving the act of burning is fire, right? the, the cause. Food satiates. So how do, I become, how do I become full and satiated? I have to eat food, consume. I'm thirsty. How do I quench my thirst? You drink water. Drinking water quenches your thirst. These are asbab and musababat, causes and effects. Who gives you strength? The food gives you strength? Who gives you, who, who causes the burning? The fire causes the burning? The water quenches your thirst? The water itself, has it got the power to quench your thirst? Where does the effect come from? The effect, basic point of aqidah, is by the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you bring a fire to something, it will burn because Allah created the act of burning. If Allah does not want to create the act of burning, the object will not be burnt. The example of Ibrahim salam, he was thrown to the fire. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Ya Naru, kuni bardam wa salaman ala Ibrahim. O fire be uh, 
Dard be cool and peaceful for Ibrahim. And he went in there and he wasn't affected by the fire. And they say the fire was so large that birds would fly over this fire and drop dead. They couldn't put Ibrahim al-Islam to the fire. They had to catapult him in. It was so strong. They couldn't get near it. How could they put him in? They catapulted him in. He fell into the fire. Angel Jibreel Islam came to him. It's a beautiful saying because Angel Jibreel Islam came and said, Oh Ibrahim, do you have anything to ask your Lord? He said, Ilmuhu bihali yughni an su'ali. Imam Niyatullah mentions this in the book of Illumination, Kitab al Tanweer. Um, he said, His knowledge, Allah's knowledge of my hal, yughni an su'ali, suffices me from asking you anything. My heart's with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the Prophets, salam, salatu wasalam, talking about your heart being with Allah, and the heart of Ibrahim is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He didn't need to ask Ibrahim alayhi salam. And Allah protected him and made the fire cool for him. Does the knife cut in of itself with its own power? Or is it Allah that creates the act of cutting when the knife is placed on object with the correct pressure? It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that creates. It's not your job that gives you rizq. It's not that your job that gives you status in society. It's not your money in your bank account that helps you buy things. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's bounty. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's nurturing you and giving you those things. Because people can eat and people can work. And there may well be somebody just like you somewhere in the world who's got just as much education, does the same job, has worked hard, but Allah's not given him of the dunya what Allah has given you. The exact same situation. Why have you got the dunya and he hasn't? In terms of asbab, in terms of taking the means, you did exactly the same thing. One was successful and one wasn't. Why? Who made the asbab, the causes, give the effects? It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't think if you're in a situation of success in the dunya, it's your hard work and your doing this. You should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the bounty he's bestowed upon you. This is a very important concept that we need to understand. Even the food we eat, we should rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving us the strength from that food and not being, it's heedlessness. It's not, it's not sinful to be in such a state or it's not um, you know, disbelief to think that the food gives me strength whilst being in a state of heedlessness. That's common, right? Food will satiate me. I'm hungry, I'm eating food. And you forget about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the equation. It's a heedless state to be. It's not good. Um, we need to improve this. This is what the Imam is saying. I saw people looking at you know, the dunya, uh, and you know everything's from the dunya and status and food and sustenance and arguments and enmity because they don't understand everything is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if your heart is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trust me there wouldn't be a moment of sadness in your life how can you be sad if Allah is with you how can you grieve Allah inna awliya Allahi la khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun and the funny, th funny thing is la khawfun alayhim Walahum yahzanun, and they don't, they, they never, in other words, yahzanun. They will never ever be sad, because they can't be sad. Why? Because they're with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. They won't feel this sadness. Why? Because they're with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. They will be concerned. They will, you know, because there's tests to come. There might be difficult situations. They'll be concerned, but their hearts won't be sad. They won't grieve in the same way that others grieve. Why? Because they don't understand the wisdom of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. The last one, he says, Rahmatullah I saw everyone relying on something created. So reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some on the dinar and dirham. Some on their wealth and property. Some on their business and trade. And others on something, uh, on similar created things. So I meditated on his statement. وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ Whoever relies upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he is enough for him. And the message is, what the Imam says, we'll finish with his words. Um, and I meditate upon the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whoever, verily, whoever relies upon Allah, he is his sufficiency. Surely Allah brings his command to pass. God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has a port, made a portion for everything. So I relied upon Allah and he is my sufficiency and the best of trustees. Hasbunallahu fahuwa hasbi wa ni'mal wakil. And we say, Hasbunallah. هو نعم الوكيل والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين جزاكم الله خيرا